Welcome. Thank you for choosing to listen to another word-filled message by David Entry. Preaching is the means by which God manifests his word and nourishes our spirits. May the life of God enter into you and you as you listen to this message. Be blessed. If you say we don't, the, the views, the various views, about four views people give to say hell is not necessary because hell is not real because the views of hell, wrong views about hell. You know, when we say someone is saved, sometimes church, please, let not only think we have saved, <laughs> especially the deliverance of my charismatic church is only focused on we have been saved from demons. Wow. No, it's not demons, though, please. Demons have access to you because of your sin and uh, you are not under Christ. But we are actually been saved. Christ is our savior. Save us from hellfire. That's why that, that should be good. That should be just justification enough or rightful enough for you to get up and go and preach the gospel and help young people, save people from hellfire. You are boasting about how good a Christian you are, but you don't preach the gospel. It puts a big question mark on your claims of Christianity or how good that good a Christian because you've been praying. You know me, I fast 40 days every month. Oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I fast three times a year. 50 days, three times a year. Listen, it's not a reflection of how good a Christian you are. Even how regularly you come to church, which is necessary, is not necessarily a, a reflection. Some of you are always in church, but out you have not gone once, and you are not ashamed of it. It, it. You don't feel anything about it, yet you are believing God for a breakthrough. And watch others break down. And yeah, you want a breakthrough, whilst you're watching others, supervising others, because no, no, outreach and evangelism is, my, is not my thing. Maybe Jesus is not your Lord, that's why. Jesus, because you are come with your own terms. Please, please, drop that, drop that Christianity of convenience. So I say this to your challenge, that rise up to the challenge of going out and winning souls. Step out of your comfort zone. This Christianity of convenience, it leaves a big question mark on your life. I'm talking to those who are saved. The nominal church and nominal Christians can't be bothered about this. That's important. But those of us who Christ is our Lord, I, I, he's either Lord of all or not Lord at all. So Jesus said in Matthew chapter 26, verse 24, about Judas that it would have been better if he had not been yeah, born. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because see, when you are born and you live a life, after here, the judgment, the life you have lived, you have lived, sorry, it makes the judgment and the retribution afterwards will make you re- regrettable for the life you have lived. It would have been better if you are not born. Because it doesn't, and he said, Jesus said, but woe unto the man whom the, the, the son of, of whom by the son of man is betrayed. It had, been be, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. His mother should have had miscarriage. That's what Jesus is saying. His mother should have suffered miscarriage than to be born and come and live the life some of us are living. <laughs> you think this one is only Judas? No, all of us. Because after here, so it may even look like you should have died before you became a teenager. Because you would have retained certain levels of innocence. But look, it has all been erased from you. Your level of guilt and, you know, you don't have one iota of innocence. <laughs> Not all of us. But all of us have gone, might have gone very far. However, the good news, Iwan Gileon, the good news is that if you can put your trust in Jesus and make him actually your Lord, then you will not suffer hellfire and you walk with him. For there is now, therefore, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Death is something that you can't do do away with. Everybody is coming. And death, unfortunately, comes to young people, old people, 
women and men, rich people, poor. Death comes at anybody. And death does not come with advance notice. <laughs> it just comes when it is ready to come. And so it is necessary. That's why uh, the um, this Bible says that the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. Where people are mourning, where there is mourning, you know, not mourning, M O R O, sorrow. When someone is dead, and we said the house, the, the heart of the wife in Ecclesiastes is in a house of mourning. You think that you go, you, th- you see, better is it to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. You are always thinking of parties. Go for some funerals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the Bible says that. The heart of the fool is in the house of meth. Hey, 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 just always, always, hey, 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 take it easy. All right, let's move on. I don't like the way you are quiet over me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Matthew 10, 28. Thank you, Jesus. And fear not them which kill the soul, but are not able to kill the, sorry, who kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body, where? Both soul and body. In other words, that means that when you die, when it's time for the resurrection, your body will be brought back to the soul. So it's not like the body will just decompose on earth and that's it. No, no. It will later on be brought back. And God said, I can destroy the resurrected body, the refurbished body that has come back. I will destroy it. Hell. Yeah. Hell is to destroy. <laughs> so that, remember what I just said, because there's an objection to eternality of hell. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So it says, first point here, the first word I want you to note is hell. Okay, hell. Hell is real. Now, as I told you the other time, Old Testament does not say much about hell because people would have said that Paul, with his assertiveness or um, harsh-mindedness, would just be importing and speaking about hell. And, the, and hell is Old Testament. New Testament is grace. Actually, the Old Testament didn't say much about hell. They didn't speak too much about hell. One or two points about Sheol. That is the life, the intermediary state. Sheol and Hades. But hell, and then when it comes to the New Testament, um, Paul didn't really say much about hell. The epistles didn't say much about hell. The one who spoke much about hell is Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the concentration of them is in Matthew. His first teaching his first teaching, Matthew chapter 5, Beatitude, is there. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22. He introduced hell. Excuse me. 5.22, please. I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the counsel. But, who, uh, but whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. That means hell has fire. Hellfire. Jesus introduced it in his teachings. Look at verse 28. I think verse 28. Um, uh, uh, the, the, if you commit a woman, uh, if you adultery, verse 29 and 30. Let's see that. Yeah. He uh, says that if you plug it out and cast it from thee, for it's better, uh, for it is profitable for thee that one of your members should perish and not the whole body be cast into hell. So you say, oh, I'm struggling with this sin. It's better you find a way of dealing with that struggle than you go and your whole body struggle in hell. Oh, that's my only weakness. Please, that only, uh, even if you have to chop off, (laughs) it didn't mean physically chop it off. But you have to take a drastic action so you don't end up burning in hell. I was telling some 
young people, that some of you, if you go to hell, it's going to be wild for you because some of you will be going to hell with your tears of your mother on your head. Your mother kept praying and crying over you, and you didn't listen. You are going to hell with tears of your mother, your mother's tears dropping on your head. It will push you to the hottest part of hell. <laughs> so, you just spoke about hell in Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 13, no, Matthew chapter, um, yeah, 22, Matthew chapter 18, Matthew chapter 25. In fact, let me go to 25. I may not come. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Verse 41 is said that, then shall he say unto them on the left hand, depart from me, you cursed. Give New King James, please. Depart, depart from me, you cursed. In into the everlasting fire prepared for, remember this, okay? Prepared for who? All right. So hell originally, I'm just going ahead of myself so that we don't, it's prepared for the devil and his angels. All right. Look at verse 43. 43. I was hungry I, 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 I was a stranger, you did not take me in. This is a sin of omission, what you didn't do. You are not punished only for what you do, commission. You are also punished for what you didn't do. Right. You did not. <laughs> I was naked and you did, not, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Go to the next verse. Then he shall... Uh, then they also will answer him, Lord, when will you go to the verse 40, next verse, I want to the, and then he shall say to them, I surely I say unto you, how much are you not doing? Okay, verse 46, the one I'm looking for. Then I will say, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. Did you see the two? So everlasting, say everlasting. everlasting. Say that again. Everlasting. How long is the punishment? So it's an everlasting punishment. It lasts forever. Hey, that's yours. So this is a small temptation. Eh? It's not forever. Oh, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just five seconds. Temptation. It lasts forever. Everlasting. So Mark chapter 9, verse 44. Nine, Mark 9, 44. This is, go to 43, please. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. The hand you are using to browse or to steal, to change the figures, or to handle, squeeze, uh, whatever. <laughs> or to masturbate. So that if your... <laughs> I didn't say it. I thought you were a Christian. Yes. See, that's why, you see, it's very convenient for some people to say that you can't follow the Bible. Yeah. I'm a Christian, but I don't take everything in the Bible. You are not a Christian. That's the number one sign that you are not a Christian. You don't take everything the Bible is saying. It's a sign you are not a Christian. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, because being a Christian means I, I submit myself to the Lordship of Christ. And how do you know the Lordship of Christ? This word, forever, O Lord, that word is settled. So if you can't accept what God is saying, please, you are not a Christian. Maybe you are an explorer. Ah. You are trying to explore. <laughs> yeah, you are a researcher. In America, they call them the seekers, seeker sensitive. You have to be very careful about you because you have not actually discovered God and you are trying every religion to see. So you go to Islam to see, uh, you go to practice Hinduism, practice Shintoism, and try this. Uh, okay, go, go quietly, watch them, uh, observe, and see. You end up with Confucianism. When you see people who said, Me, I believe everything, that's a def clear definition of a confused man. You can't even believe in Christianity and believe in Islam. They, they, listen, people say they are fundamentally the same, but superficially different. No, they are superficially the same, fundamentally different. Yeah. Christianity and Islam are two complete, completely different things. Completely. So you can't say, I believe in that and I believe in that too. Syncretism means that I believe in a combination of a different thing. I add this in theological circles, it's called syncretism, amalgamation of different beliefs together and yeah and that's a, a anybody has seen someone who say i believe in everything see they are so confused and some of you have attempted believing in a lot of things and you are left with confusion 
So if you are a Christian, you believe in God's word. That's where it starts from, excuse me. Those who say, oh, it's not that way, I'm a Christian. Well, how did you become a Christian? Can you define what you mean by being a Christian? What do you mean by being a Christian? I believe in God Almighty. Muslims also believe in that. So you're not a Christian. It doesn't make you a... Believing in Almighty God doesn't make you a Christian. It doesn't make you a Christian. Ah, okay, but I believe in Jesus Christ. Excuse me, what do you mean by that? That Jesus, you know, how did you know him? Were you there when he was living? <laughs> Have you seen him before? Can you tell me what you mean by you believe in Jesus? What do you mean? Who is Jesus? What did he teach? What does he... How would you know Jesus outside of the scripture? How? So you're actually, you're actually deluded. You are confused. You are purporting to know something you are very ignorant about. You don't know Jesus. Because if you know Jesus, he said in John chapter 5, I don't want to go to new creation realities back like last, John 5, 30, 30, 39. He said, you said through the scriptures, thinking that in, in them you have eternal life. And these scriptures are pointing to me. These scriptures speak. The scriptures, all scripture, paragrapha, all scripture is about Jesus. He said, it's about me. This thing is about me. When he resurrected from the dead, in Luke chapter 24, from verse 24, Bible says that from Moses, talking about Genesis, the books of Moses, all the way to the end, and particularly that time their scripture was the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament. It says that beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all, in all scripture, not part scripture, in all scriptures, the things concerning himself, the scriptures about him. And verse, I think verse 45 there, then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and then they knew. Verse 45. Then he opened the understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Look at the next verse. Then they said, thus, uh, thus, thus it is written, written, and that it was necessary for the Christ. They began to understand the Christ. How can you know the Christ without the scriptures? I'm trying to make a case against all those who, who claim they are Christians, but they said, I can't take everything in the Bible. We can't distance ourselves from our message so that we can look nice. Some people have stopped and have hidden preachers. We have hidden and marginalized the, the wrath of God so we can attract more people to Jesus. So we are trying to, oh, God is not angry. You don't worry, God is not angry. Come, come, come. Je, come just as you are, God. Don't come just as you are. Repent. <laughs> I'm glad some of you are hearing things that you will not hear normally in our times. But you have to hear, I'm talking to Christians. All right, let's go on this uh, hell issue again. Back, back, back to hell. <laughs> so what are the alternative views on hell people give? Number one, people say you make hell right here in this life. Yeah, so people say well, there's no hell anywhere. Hell is the challenges and the troubles, that's hell. So hell is just a philosophical ideology. The reality is what you go through. So when people, sometimes people, if God will punish them, he let them go through hell. Come on, that's not, that's not true. Because there are people who you know should be, in, should be going through hell who actually look like they are in heaven on, on earth. Wicked people. Wicked people, they live luxuriously. And there are people who you know should, should be living more favorably, comfortably on earth who are going through so much you don't understand. So what you go on earth, what you go through on earth is not the hell Jesus spoke about because he said, don't be afraid of the one who will kill your body. So after you are dead, you are gone. Natural life is gone. So that cannot be the hell Jesus is talking about. Does that make sense? So number one, object, number one alternative view of hell is debunked. Number two, this is a big one, it's called annihilationism. To annihilate, you know what it means, you should know that, to annihilate. Get wiped out, okay? So people believe in, and this is very important. I'm now going to theological, strong, stronger theological matters on health, on hell. People believe in annihilationism. 
means that you have been scrapped. Once you die, God destroys you. It's like you are done. It's like the way maybe a, a car is taken to scrap yard and scrap. It ceases to exist. People believe in that. So people say this. Matthew 10, 28. Watch this. This is very important. This is very important to understand. Matthew 10, 28. Both, you see, this word, this word. What word is this? Destroy. One more time, please. Destroy. Louder, please. Destroy. So it says that God is able to destroy both your soul. So this point, they stand on this to say that once you die and God is going to deal with you hell, it's just annihilation. It just crafts you, destroys your whole, you don't exist anymore. That's very important. But the, the, the problem there is that the Greek word translated destroy, I'll come to that. I'll come to that. I'll talk about that a little bit more. So I'll leave that and let me go to the third point. So annihilationism means that when you die, you cease to exist. When God is punishing you, you cease to exist. The next point is that um, the next view is universalism. Universalism. Universalism is very interesting. They believe that everybody eventually will end up in heaven. Everybody. Because God cares about everybody. So universalism means that maybe God can punish you just a little while about from about one month or two months or something. But eventually everybody will go to heaven. <laughs> That's universalism. And watch this. Many Many Christian organizations, churches, more believe in nowadays, believe more in this. It's because of the humanist ideology that has invaded our, uh, our generation. That the earth and human beings are more important than any other thing in life. Are more important than God. So God owes human beings the protection. And so there are people who are supposed, who believe they are Christians, but their focus is more human beings. Human beings are more important. Yes, human beings are important, but no more important than the God, the purpose of God. You are here because God has a purpose for you. You are not here because you, uh, God sent you here to come and honor you and come and worship you. You are here on assignment. And after you die, then you have to give an account. So anyway, um, the universalism means that uh, they even teach the um, universal brotherhood. We are all the sons of God. We are all, all creation, including the animals. We are all, and one day, we are all going to live in peace together, and everything is going to be nice. God doesn't have to judge anybody. I, are you listening? Some of you are sleeping, but I, I don't care. I'll preach anyway. M make sure you go to the right place afterwards, after you die. All right. And, and then the third, uh, the fourth view. So the first view, what's the first view? Huh? Hell is wherever you are on this earth, where you make up. What's the second view? Yeah. Annihilationism. The third view. Yeah. The fourth view is inclusivism. Selective inclusivism, you can put it like. Inclusive. Now, that means that God will not exclude everybody. He will only exclude those who heard the gospel and didn't believe. So people who have never heard the gospel before, who died, God will include them. Come. Yeah. See, these things sound very... Nice and wonderful. But it cannot be supported and endorsed by scripture. So, inclusivism. You don't, let's, listen, listen. Why, why do you say it cannot be supported and endorsed? There's only one, there are many ways to hell. I said it last week. What are some of the ways to hell? Any sin. So, that sin of what? Fornication or what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> steal, stealing. <laughs> <laughs> What? Pornography. No, that one we can't say. Too many people feel bad. Uh, <laughs> gossip. Pride. Being Hitler's assistant. Being, a ni being the nice person who is helping people in your community, but full of pride. You see, so uh, there's an, uh, an old English uh, axiom that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. 
So you are, oh, I'm, most people want to be born again, but you know, I intend to do it one day. I will do your good intentions. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So then sin sends us to hell. Which sin? There are about 120 sins mentioned in the Bible. That makes people uh, uh, potential candidates of hell. So there are many, can you imagine, in the New Testament, there are over 120 routes to hell. I don't know which one you want to use, but (laughs) say God forbid. forbid. But watch this, there's only one way to heaven or out of hell, which is for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes, watch this, believes in him should not perish. Conditional, that's it. Your not perishing is subject to you believing. Is this what you, okay, how about Abraham? Abraham believed. All those who were saved in the Old Testament were saved only one way, through Christ. They believed in advance. And we are believing on credit. We have been forgiven on credit. All right, so once you believe in it, it takes care of your, in him, it takes care of your sins in the past and everything. So the cross, I, I explain this, the cross is in the middle of the ages. Before the cross, all those who were before the cross look to the cross to be saved. All those of us who are after the cross look to the, back to the cross for our salvation. The cross is the defining factor. Oh, but it's not fair. You see, you talking about fairness, don't, see, don't reason with God. God has in his own wisdom, he knows how he will save. And if God is judging humanity for our sins, he's not done anything wrong because we actually deserve hell. Oh, yes. See, that's what people come to church and they are, I said it on Thursday, you are complaining so much about church. You have forgot, forgotten how God has forgiven your sins and you are not going to hell. And you are picking on the usher and you are so upset about an usher every time, making so much issue about church usher when you have been forgiving your sins and even after your major forgiveness, there are still a lot of little, 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 little servicing of sins. Sin services. Only God knows where you have been within the past seven days. There are things, there are things that has happened which nobody knows. But it's not, it's, 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 you should be thinking about how you for, he will forgive you. Instead of thinking about what others have done against you. So, there's only one way to be saved, and that is through Jesus Christ our Savior. Let me pick on the annihilationism. When Matthew chapter eight, uh, 10 verse 28 talks about how um, he will destroy. That Greek word destroyed is apol- a- 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 apolomi. Used 80 times in the New Testament. Listen to this very carefully. 80 times. And every single time it was not translated destroy. There are times it is translated like um, her- Herod wanted to destroy the child. Matthew chapter 2 verse 8. 13. When Herod, the, uh, the angel said, take the child away, because arise, take the flea, and bring, uh, uh, Herod will seek the young child to destroy. That word destroy is not to annihilate. It's just to murder. So murder was translated destroy there, okay? But I mean, he wants to murder the child. In other places, Bible talks about how uh, 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 Jesus Christ and his disciples, they were on the boat in Matthew chapter 8, verse 25, and they started screaming, Oh, 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 oh. Disciples came to him, and he said that, Lord, save us, we perish. That word perish is the Apollo me. We are, we, are, we are drowning, drowning. So if you take it as annihilation, you're wrong, because many times it was used. Sometimes it's, it's meant drowning, other times murder, other times ruin. When it says that you put old wine in new wine skin, you ruin it. The ruin is the same Apollo, it will be ruined. So when it says that God is able to destroy you, it doesn't mean to annihilate you, but it means to render you useless and um, exert punishment on you. You will suffer in, under, under the justice of God. And when Luke chapter 15, he spoke about the lost sheep, the lost coin, okay, and the lost son. All the word lost is the same request. So you can't use one to, to refute, or to, to, it doesn't mean annihilation. Am I communicating to somebody? Jesus said that um, you, are using, you are eating bread that perish. John chapter 6 verse 27. 
bread that perishes. That word perish there is the same word in John 17, chapter 12. I quoted it earlier on. The son of perdition. I didn't quote it earlier on. Jesus Christ, uh, Judas is called the son of perdition. The word perdition means that the son of destruction or the one who is meant for destruction. It's not Jesus, when, Jesus, uh, when Judas died, he wasn't annihilated. But Jesus said he went to where he belonged. All right, he went to his own place. So it doesn't mean annihilation. How about Acts chapter 8, verse 20, when Peter told the Simon the sorcerer that may your money perish with you. Peter said your money, the word perish is the same word, not your money is annihilated. So when he said that you will perish in hell, it's not meaning that you will cease to exist. That, does that make sense? So those who make a case for an annihilation are grossly mistaken. And I want to go, give you many more ones. But there's another word in the New Testament used in 2 Timothy, 2, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. It says that you shall, uh, uh, these, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of uh, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of it. They shall be punished with everlasting words, destruction. The Greek word translated that destruction is not the same as Apollomene. This one, alethros, which also means destruction. You know, so when God is going to say that those who will not believe in Jesus, they will be punished with everlasting destruction. That destruction is not like annihilation, but it's an everlasting... No, look at um, I think Mark, uh, 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. Look at 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. You need to see that one. I think that will help. 2 Corinthians 5.5. 5. Now, he who has prepared us for this same thing... Um, it's, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians. I am so sorry, please forgive me. 1 Corinthians... Deliver such a one, a brother who is in the church, who is still who is sinning. In the Corinthian church, there was a guy. There's a <laughs> in the Corinthian church, there was a guy. He said, "Watch this." In the church of Corinth, do you know what was happening? Now, they take you off the screen. Right? What was happening in the church of Corinth is that sexual promiscuity, because the Corinthians, they used to, religion was for sex. The Corinthians, their religion was very, so people were just sleeping around. You go to the temple for worship, they are temple prostitutes waiting, yeah, for session. Yeah, some of you are wishing you were here. <laughs> Somebody say, ah, we'll go to church. <laughs> we'll not miss any service. <laughs> so their worship was mixed with all kinds of practices and rituals. And core of it was sexuality. Like Satanism, they do a lot of all those things. Uh, usually, I, every idolatry goes with sexual immorality. Yeah. So, then they become born again, and they come to church. They are fiery, but their worldview is worship and having sex with anybody you like go together. And Paul has taught them, but they, that's why he wrote that if you speak in tongues and you don't have love, you are a sounding... You have to read the book of Corinthians. That's why I said, don't you know, he's that for the case, you are sinning against your body. He tell, dealt because Corinthians had a, an issue of a lot of moral issues. And then in First Corinthians, he says that uh, from verse 1, chapter 5 from verse 1, it talks about how there are immoralities amongst you. It is reported, sometimes you need somebody to report. It is reported that there is sexual immorality amongst you and such immor sexual immorality as is not even named amongst Gentiles. That a man should have his father's wife in church. He may be a prayer warrior or praise and worship leader or, I mean, usher, and he's, he's sleeping with his father's wife. I mean, the guy is and uh, Paul said, what's going on here? Go to the, and it's publicly known and it's okay. Yeah. And you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from amongst you. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. You are puffed out. Yeah. You are fine. No, it doesn't matter. We are all, you know, God is still with us. You know, he's breaking through. No. Yeah, he's breaking. Look at the verse, verse 3. Yeah. For indeed, I'm absent in the body, but present with the already judge. Of, verse 4. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you, are, you, gather, when you gather together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, go to the next verse. That's where we we'll, Deliver such one to Satan. Is this in the Bible? It's, 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 excuse me. Let's, let's get the context right. This is not socialism or social gathering or a club. It's talking about a church, a local church. All right? The local church setting. He said, when you come together, deliver such a one for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved. In the deal. So the guy is born again. Yeah. But he, has the, he won't stop this thing. He won't stop this thing. He said, I mean, and what he's doing is too bad. It's, uh, it's pernicious ah. against the image of the church. So he says that, get the, deliver him for the destruction of his flesh, his body, that his spirit might be saved. Wow. In the church. Can we practice this? No, we can't. So now he said for the destruction of the body, that word, this, the destruction of the body is the same word as was used in um, first, second Thessalonians, not Apollomi, but at, uh, 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 Aletros. Aletros, that's the Greek word. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. It talks about, it says that this shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Do you understand that? So that destruction of the body, if it is annihilation, he would have said that the guy should be annihilated. Yeah. So you save the soul. So he's not annihilated. Yeah. So those annihilationists who purport that when you die, and you, are go, you go to hell, you'll be dealt with annihilated. It's wrong. You won't be annihilated. Why? Because it is called everlasting destruction. Matthew chapter 5, verse 26, 46. Matthew 5, 46. It says that for, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 25. Please forgive me. 25, 46, 46. And all these will go away into everlasting, what? Punishment. But the righteous, what? Eternal life. If there is no everlasting, um, give me King James. Give me King James, please. Okay, so everlasting punishment and eternal life. If there is no everlasting punishment, if hell is not everlasting, then heaven is also not everlasting. In, in um, Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, it spoke about how, 12 verse 2, many of them, Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to what? Everlasting life and, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So if life, everlasting life meaning living forever, then everlasting contempt or destruction also means being destroyed forever. Now that, that begs a very important question. Before I do that, I just want to underscore with one or two points to let you know that hell is everlasting, perpetual. Not Matthew chapter 3, verse 20. Thank you, Jesus. Is somebody learning something? Matthew chapter 3, verse 12. Did I go there? It says, Who, whose fun is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat in the gun, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable. The fire is never quenchable. In Mark chapter 9, verse 44, 46, and 48. Mark 9, where they are when that, let's go to 43, so it makes sense. 43. If I, I was reading, I, didn't read, I don't think I finished this. Cut it off. It's better for you uh, for thee to enter into life maim than have two hands to go to hell, uh, go into hell. Do you see that? Go into hell. Into the fire that never shall be quenched. It's an everlasting, the fire of hell, the nature of the fire is everlasting. Verse 44, where the worm died not and the fire not quenched. 46, 46, where their worm died not, and their fire not quenched. 48, let's all read 48 together. And it's, it's interesting that this is from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus is talking about this. Jesus 
Jesus is talking about this. See, so what I'm trying to say is that the nature of hell is everlasting. It's not like you burn once and stop. That begs the question. God, is God so mean that, this is very important, this is very important, that in your short lifetime, maybe even for the first 15 years of your life, you were such a good person. But it's when you joined the guys at college, and then you became a bad guy, and now you did some wild things and murdered and murdered people's children in their womb, and or you murdered your own baby, in your womb, or something like that. You did all kinds of things, and you died at the age of thirty. So fifteen years of bad behavior, and even that, not every day. <laughs> Why will God? throw you into hell where the fires don't quench and the punishment is constant every day, 24-7. There will not be 24-7. It's just one. There's no time. Timelessly punishing. And Bible, I'm going to describe the nature of hell. Bible says that after darkness, there'll be gnashing of teeth. There'll be torture. There'll be torment, sulfur, brimstone, fire, pain, grief. Up is there. All that. You go through all this for this small. It's not proportional. How can God be so mean and punish you so severely for the little sin you committed when you go to hell? Do you, do you want to know the answer? Yes. Do you want to know the answer? Yes. Do you want to know the hands answer? Yes. The answer is yes, hell is permanent and perpetual. And once you enter, that's it. You start suffering like that eternally. You keep saying, I'm enjoying my life here. You go and meet God. Bible says that where the wrath of God, the wrath of God is against all unrighteousness. Now, do you know why Jesus cried on the cross? My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? The reason why he cried it is because according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he was made sin. All right. He has made him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Jesus knew no sin that we might become the righteous. So when Jesus was on the cross, he was not just made a sinner. He was sinless, but he became our sin. All the sins from Adam and the sins to the last human being who ever will live, all those sins were piled on him. And one of the things God cannot stand is sin. So for the first time in history or in, uh, 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 in, in time, and it, for the first time, the first person of the Trinity, Father, was separated for Jesus or when or in the time when Jesus was alive the first time God was not with him was when our sin was put on him when you put coal in hot water like uh, sorry hot fire burning coal you know you put normal coal dark coal wood or just a wood in a hot fire a fireplace it burns and after a while it's no more coal it's fire so Jesus, he was on the cross as a human being, but when our sins were put on him, he was made sin. You made him to be sin. So when what was on the cross was now our sin, and for the first time, God had to separate himself from our sins. And Jesus Christ felt the separation and screamed, why have you forsaken me, Father? And that's what killed him. The strain of the separation is what killed him. It's not the sword, it's not the beating, it's not the cross, but the strain. That's why he died prematurely on the cross. Before they could check the others, he was already dead. Because the strain, he couldn't take it. Separation with God. Separation with God killed Jesus. Now, what's the point here? Once the sin was put on him, it's an eternal wrath of God. Anyone who comes into Christ, your sin is put on him. If you don't come into Christ, you are responsible for your own sins, and God is going to punish you for your sins. Now, the question here is, why eternal? This is very important. You are saying, the reason why, you see, when you are alive, huh, you do a lot of things. How many of us have done something bad before? 
And how many of us have done something bad and you could have even ended up doing worse, but you didn't do it because of restrictions, because of convenience, because of guilt? You understand? You would have collected five people's husbands. And all, but you know, your mom was on your case. How can you do this? How can you do this? And society could, you couldn't, come on. So social restrictions didn't allow you to manifest your full human potential of sin. Are you guys what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. The laws, different things, expectations. You could. So most of us who did some bad things, we did it under a lot of restrictions. And even if you had liberty, still there was some kind of restriction. Man, now guess what? This is the point I'm trying to make. This is the point I'm trying to. In Jude, chapter of your Jude is one chapter, verse seven. Jude seven. Hmm. Now. Even Sodom, uh, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication go- and going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal. Ha- what is the nature of the fire? Eternal fire. Reading down, look at verse 15. Watch this. This is the interesting one. Verse 15 talks about. To execute this eternal fire, the purpose is to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly. Say ungodly. ungodly. So the punishment is for after everything, those who are ungodly can, will be put, let's say, you are godly in Jesus' name, Amen. are put here, and now the punishment is on the ungodly. But why are you saying they are ungodly? At the time they are being punished, they are being punished as the ungodly. Mm-hmm. Hello? Said to execute, uh, to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly amongst all they are what? Ungodly deeds. Ungodly, ungodly deeds. Are you counting the number of God? Ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all they are hard speeches which ungodly sinner has spoken against him. So when they were living, they were ungodly, ungodly, ungodly. When they are being punished, they are being punished as the ungodly. But when you are in your lifetime, because of God's conscience, conscience God puts in you, and different things, you are so restricted, you can't really exhibit your full ungodly rebellion. But when you die in hell, Bible says, away from the presence of God. So God removes all the restrictions and now you are full blown rebellious creature so people who don't believe God on earth won't believe him after earth people who rebel against God on earth will not stop rebelling as soon as they are out of here all restrictions are removed all reservations are removed and now they begin to manifest rebellion to their fullest extent so what does that mean your sins on earth which are being punished cannot even catch up with your rebellious nature eternally you will never cease being rebellious so that make warrants the eternal nature of your punishment. Because people go to hell because they are ungodly. People go to hell, watch this, this is important, because of their, their rebellion against God. And when you rebel against God on earth, when you die, it's worse. And so now that you are dead, the punishment of God will be chasing you, will be after you. And you will never end because you are wild, 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 wild. This thing is serious. It's very serious. So you don't give your life to Christ on earth. As soon as you die, the restriction is taken off. Yeah. When you die, you are free to manifest who you have always been, the ungodly self. You are now going to manifest it to its fullest. And God will punish the ungodly. Thank you, sir. God. But, so when they say it's going to be a short time, because somebody's short time says, in fact, when you die, your sin is worse. Because mm. you are now a full rebel. If you didn't believe in Christ on earth, you won't believe him after you die. Mm. If you rebelled against Christ on earth, when you die, you even, the rebellion, uh, rebellion will be more. More. 
beaucoup de rébellions. Ah. <laughs> Alléluia. You can't say amen to <laughs> Oh man, I have to end here. Oh, I wanted to give you the. Yeah, I think let me let me end here. Oh, let me mention this. Then next week I'll continue. I think I have to mention this. This is very important. I told you, hell, who was hell prepared for? So people say that hell is not for man. That we have to establish that. So hell is not for man because Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, he said, the hell is actually a place prepared. Though. God has builders, they work there and they prepare the place. <laughs> All this, Matthew 25, verse 46, please. All this shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the, uh, um, um, sorry, verse 20, 40, 41, sorry, for, for verse 41. They, um, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for who? So people believe that it's not human beings that will go there. It's demons and the devil. So now let's find out whether human beings will be there too. Because in fact, in fact from this text, it said you. The text that depart from me, ye cast into. So you are going into this everlasting fire that wasn't prepared for you. It wasn't prepared for you. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. Oh, I like this one. Revelation 20 says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beasts and the false prophets, false prophets are human beings. False prophets are human beings. The beast is a human, human personality. The 666, the Antichrist, human personality. He said, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are and shall be tormented how long? Day and night for how long? Forever. Look at the verse 11. So actually, all right, that, that's it. Actually, the, the false prophets, if human beings wouldn't go there, why is the Bible talking about false prophets? Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, 10, 11. That one, very worrying. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his Mark on his forehead and his, in his, on his hand. The beast, the mark of the beast. You see, what is going to happen? One, I think one day I, I didn't ever finish Revelation. I only did Revelation chapter 1, 2, 3. Yeah. And I, last year, the whole of last year was our year of Revelation. And I was teaching from Revelation. I could only do Revelations 1, 2, and 3. But there's more in Revelations. Now, there's going to come the tribulation and the Antichrist is going to be ruling mm. and for you to be able to buy and sell, you need a special card and a special NI number, a chip. And that chip will not be in your pocket, but it will be inserted in your body. So you go to the shop, ask that, you, everything you pick, your chip is just taking it and go. You don't use money again. But that tells everywhere you have been, where you are, whether you are asleep, like the way the Fitbits can tell how much you have worked and all. Everything will monitor your life. And that sign, that, that, that inscription is the sign of the beast. If you don't receive it, you can't buy and sell. Like you want to buy a house, you need to have some credit history. Yes. Like you, you need a credit card, you know, for them to see that you pay or something before they give you some loan. Yeah, some of you would have had, like Pastor Wu, wouldn't have a credit card. But when we went to buy a house years ago, they said, no, you need to get a credit card. Mm. So after a few months, we can see that you, just for your name to be in the credit system. So we went for it. So let's say so you don't believe in credit card, you, buy, you have to buy cash. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? And so there are systems. There are systems. Now, a, t- a time is coming when you have been parking your car, you don't need coins anymore. Yeah. Now it's a lot of places. You, you just call, app is changing everything. Now everything is going to be on the app. You are going to Heathrow or going to the airport flying. You check in on the app. You do everything you book on the. You can sit in church and instead of reading your Bible, be on the app. And the point here is that if you say no, 
you will be exempted from a lot of benefits. If you receive it, that means that you have accepted his lordship. Now, those who receive the lordship of the Antichrist, now that's why I say what's going to happen to them. Verse 9 again. And the angel said, uh, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his forehead or his hand, or, 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 or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of God's wrath, the wrath of God. It's like wine, you drink it. The same shall drink it, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall, he shall be torment, uh, tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. This one who received the mark of the beast, God's wrath will come and torment you when it comes to the hell time. Now look at the next verse. Look at the name. And the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever, and they, they have no rest day nor night. Who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark on his, of, his, of his name. This is talking about human beings. So those who say hell is only for demons, human beings will also feature. It wasn't prepared for human beings. So why don't you care not going there? It's a choice. It's a choice. It's a, how many of you are, are not going to go there? <laughs> you don't go there just by raising hands, by, by, by accepting the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That's how you avoid going there. Let me add this last scripture. There are so many scriptures, but let me add this. In second, we already earlier on, but I think we need to just read Second Thessalonians chapter. Oh, this is good. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Somebody say thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you learning something? Yes. We have to understand this whole thing about hell. Most of us have heard about coming about it. Uh, when I die, whether I'm going or not, uh, well, uh, coming about it. But you have to prepare. What did I say? Which scripture did I quote? Are you sure? Yes. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. I think I'll prefer to read from the verse 7. So that, um, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 7, so that ye, ye, so that ye were assembled to all. All right, verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and in Achaia, but also in every place. Please forgive me. Forgive me. I'm, that's verse 7. To you, verse 7, second, I'm sorry about that, please. And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the, Lord Jesus, um, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. That know, listen to this. Them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he's coming to take vengeance on those who don't know God, two categories of people, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let people do what they want to do. There's a day of reckoning coming. Let people do what they want to do. Let them change laws. I say, it's my body. I want to do what I want. Paul, what, what, excuse me, what has somebody who died some years ago got to do with my life? Okay. I'm not interested in all this stuff. Let them live their life. Bible says that as it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, so in the days of Noah, in Luke, I tell you I won't quote a scripture, but I like quoting scripture. So those of you who claim you don't know where to read when you go home, Luke chapter 17, it says, verse 25, it said, as it was, it said, verse 26, verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. What is, the, what is unique about those days? Watch this, verse 27. Quick, please. They did eat and drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark. And the flood came and destroyed them all. Noah warned them, told them there's a day coming. He warned them, told them there's a day coming. Warned them, told them, change, repent. They won't listen. And Jesus says that the way it was in the days of Noah, it will be the same. Preachers will be preaching and people will not listen. They will listen. They will still go for the girls in church. Yeah. The brother. He will listen. <laughs> they will listen. People will not listen. 
You, you love your boyfriend so much. You love your girlfriend so much. You don't care what God has got to say. Yeah. You are having fun. You, you, you are having fun. Hey, sister, you, you are having fun. Hey, brother, you are... You. <laughs> <laughs> but no, 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 please, live your life. But I'm just telling you. Mm. So you, you cannot say, I did not know. Mm. You cannot say before God that, oh, Lord, give me another chance. Mm. Jesus, talk, Jesus spoke about the story. Jesus spoke about the story. Look, 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 chapter 16. Mm. Look, chapter 16. Jesus spoke, about, <laughs> Jesus spoke about the story of Lazarus. Lazarus and the rich man. The rich man went to hell. When he died, he went to hell. When he died, he went to hell. When he died, riches could not save him. He went to hell. When he died, the rich man went to hell. When he died, he went to hell. Jesus told this story. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And there he was in torment. Yeah. The description of hell. Yeah. There he was in torment. Yeah. Being tormented. Seen, you can see heaven. Those in heaven won't see you, but you will see them. It's like when you're walking in darkness and there are people in the room having party. You can see in the window, oh man. <laughs> oh yeah, he saw a five round Lazarus in his bosom. He said, I need water. That tells you there'll be tests. There is a place of test. Cried out for Abraham, Mr. Mr. Lazarus, to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in the flames. Oh, only small bit of water drop. I need it. He said, No, no, we can't come over you because we don't have what it takes. He said, he said In your lifetime, you receive it, that good things, and likewise, Lazarus, evil thing. But now he's comforted and thou art tormented. The next verse. Watch this, I want to show you something. And beside all things, between us and you, there's a great girl fix. So that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. We can't come there. Neither can they pass to us. That will come from thence. Now watch, watch this. The next verse, verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, Father, send, uh, that, that, would, uh, that, uh, that would send him to my father's house. What's about your father's house? For I have five brothers. That they may tell, he may testify to them that they may not come to this place. You see, I want to draw attention to something. The next verse. Look at this. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. When you read the Bible and come across Moses and the prophets, means the scriptures. Mm. Okay. People can come from hell. It will not make you born again. Mm. Wow. Outside of the scriptures. Mm. Being a Christian can never happen outside of scriptures. So he said, instead of wanting some very t- 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 serious miracles, he said, no, let them give attention to the word. If they won't believe the word, doesn't matter what. If they will not change because of the word, miracles will not change them. Exactly. That's what he said. Let them hear them. Mm. Look at it. Is it the last verse? Yeah. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if someone went unto them from the dead, eh, they will believe, they will repent, they will if it's God, that's serious. And Father Abraham, what did he say? What did Father Abraham say? And he said, oh, If they hear not Moses and the prophet, neither will they be persuaded. No, Though one rise, rose from the dead and went. The word of God is what changes people. A message from hell. Maybe there's a former boyfriend. For my girlfriend, he said, please tell her for me. Tell him for me. I'm tormented here. Please tell him mm. to change. Mm. Get, tell him to give his life to Christ. Mm. Please, please, I beg you. I wish I could send a letter myself or email a WhatsApp. I don't have a phone. I would have sent a WhatsApp. <laughs> Listen, this is WhatsApp from hell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a long message. Wow. It's a good message. But Jesus spoke about how Paul said that he will punish with everlasting Second Thessalonians. That's the last scripture I was quoting. But he will punish Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse nine. Said, "Who shall who he shall punish everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power?" Hell is real. We are candidates of heaven, not because we are well behaved, but because we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, it talks about Jesus Christ is the only one who can save us from hell. It says that who shall come 
uh, 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 when he shall come to, uh, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony amongst you is so. Well, first, first Thessalonians 1.10, please, First Thessalonians. And to wait for his son from heaven who, has, who he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The only way to escape is Jesus. Many ways to go, but it's only way to escape. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. One day, you stand before the judgment seat of God, and this preaching will be referred. This message will be referred. It will be called up, and what you were thinking when the message was being preached will all be played to you. One day, one day, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give re- accounts of what we have done, whether good or bad in our body. There's a time coming. Please repent from your sins, for hell is real. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to this message by David Entry. To hear more from David Entry, Follow him on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. You can also subscribe to Caris Church on YouTube. Don't forget to share and subscribe to our podcast so you're always up to date. Be blessed.